I hope everybody's been uh, enjoying uh, tests so far. Uh, day two, so we're halfway halfway through this uh, this conference. It has been amazing. I, I really enjoyed watching the many uh, presenters interacting with you. I've learned a uh, learned a great deal. And one of the big things that Tess has done for me is it's gotten me back on Twitter. I didn't want to do it, but I'm back. I uh, followed all of the excitement. I've decided to to join the world of that. So please. Welcome everybody and we will have, we will get started. Hello, Lena. Hi. Hi, Dr. Welcome. Ono, welcome. So while uh, you're coming in, please introduce yourselves. Um, we would like to know who you are, where you're from, and um, if, 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 you have, if you have a time, just throw in one quick line about what you enjoyed the most so far about TESS Online 2020. It's my first time at this conference, and, and for me, it's like Christmas Day. I, I've, I've learned so much, and I've seen so much. It's, it's really been amazing. And as you do that, I'm just going to uh, discuss with you the, the housekeeping rules. Um, first of all, I'd let you know that uh, Dr. Santa J. Ono is here. He's the president and vice chancellor of the University of British Columbia, and I'll formally introduce him in a few minutes. Um, please make sure that, so he's going to do a presentation, and then afterwards, he's going to open it up to some questions. So if you do have questions, please share your questions, but I will also allow you to speak um, so just if you want to do that, turn off your turn on your mics and um, and and ask your questions. So just make sure that you're you're muted during the during the um, the, the story that you're unmuted when you ask your question. Uh, your video uh, is disabled when you when you when you're entering, as you can see. And if you would like closed captioning, there is a button at the bottom. Please make sure you turn that on if if you need that. And also, just please note that the session is being recorded. So I will begin. Um, please um, allow, join me in welcoming Santa J. Ono. He is the president and vice chancellor of the University of British Columbia, which is a role that he assumed in, on August 15, 2016. Professor Ono is a director on the board of Universities Canada and serves on the association's international committee. As a professor of medicine and biology, Professor Ono has worked at Harvard, Johns Hopkins, University College London, and Emory Universities. In 2015, he was inducted by Johns Hopkins into its Society of Scholars, which honors former faculty who have gained distinction in their fields. Professor Ono's research encompasses the immune system, eye inflammation, and age-related macular degeneration, which is the leading cause of blindness. He and his research team are working to develop a blood test that could identify biomarkers in people who are progressing towards that disease. Professor Ono was the first Asian American president of the University of Cincinnati, where he was appointed in 2012. Previously, he served as the university provost and senior vice president for academic affairs. And prior to that, to, to, that, to his recruitment to the University of Cincinnati, Professor Ono was senior vice provost and deputy to the provost at Emory University. As a university administrator, Professor Ono is deeply committed to diversity and his achievements were recently recognized by the American Council on Education with an award that honors individuals who have demonstrated leadership and commitment on a national level to the advancement of racial and ethnic minorities in higher education. Inside Higher Education named him America's most notable university president in 2015. Please welcome Professor Santa J. Ono. Well, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. And um, it's wonderful to connect with all of you virtually at this exciting uh, conference. I'm really honored to have been joined uh, to spend some time with you today. And I just wanted to start off by saying, for those of you who have been to the University of British Columbia, that uh, we are at the, on the tra traditional ancestral and ceded territory of a number of First Nations. Uh, the Vancouver campus is on the Musqueam First Nation land on the 
edge of the Pacific Ocean here in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. And the UBC Okanagan campus is on the Silks Okanagan Nation uh, land. Uh, and so we're very fortunate to, to be based in two beautiful parts of, of Canada. And uh, I'm looking forward to just sharing uh, some remarks with you, and, but also to answer any questions that you, that you might have uh, around the topics that are the focus of this uh, conference. It's always a, a privilege to be included in, in important conversations about the trends and practices that are revolutionizing the future of teaching and learning. And I'm humbled to be with you. Many of you really are innovators in the space, uh, recognized not only in Ontario, but across Canada and around the world. So I'm looking forward to sharing our experiences here at uh, UBC, uh, but also hearing about what you are experiencing uh, at your institution. This virtual medium really in, in, in many ways illustrates uh, what we're dealing with uh, over the past several months and probably for several months to come. And I think you'll all agree that uh, this uh, abrupt transition to remote instruction has been challenging for all sectors uh, and especially in education, not only in post-secondary, but uh, also in, uh, in primary and secondary schools. So this is really an appropriate conversation for us to be having and for us to co collectively brainstorm about how to best teach remotely, how to make it fun and uh, enriching for both the student as well as, as the instructor. And uh, this is reality uh, as of March. And uh, it's uh, something that we can discuss about how institutions have been dealing uh, with this disruption uh, caused by a global pandemic. There are are many negative uh, sides to this uh, transition uh, to remote, but there are also positive aspects that I'm happy to, to share with you because it's uh, forced us to move very quickly uh, to uh, remote, uh, something that many people have felt uh, uh, could, could have taken much longer were it not for the pandemic. So that might be the silver lining of what we're experiencing uh, today. I'm just uh, slightly exaggerating when I tell you that at the University of British Columbia, we have been moving at warp speed uh, since March, and I'm sure many of you feel that way. Uh, we're certainly, as a, a globe, uh, trying to identify therapies and vaccines uh, as fast as we can because uh, there's been a tremendous impact on our sector because of, of the pandemic. But we've also been moving warp speed, not only in terms of our medical research, but also uh, in terms of, uh, of, of, of transitioning to remote and, and trying to innovate uh, as we move forward uh, to make the experience as enriching as possible. This is a photograph of, of UBC um, and this is a, a little bit old. You can see there's a crane there and um, that's uh, a building which is going up, which is part of the Ponderosa Commons uh, that's, that's going up right now. And you can see that we're on the Pacific Ocean um, I'm actually in that building, not right now, but my office is at the top floor of the building, which is uh, uh, to, to the right of the slide. Um, it's Kerner Library, and the very top floor uh, is where my offices are. Um, and as you can see, um, that the, 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 the roof of the building uh, resembles a book that has been turned upside down. The spine is actually um, in the very middle of the building. And so um, it was designed as such um, because uh, um, this, it is a library. And I, I, I'm told that when Queen Elizabeth actually opened the Kerner Library building, she was very impressed uh, with uh, uh, its, its architecture and, and, uh, um, and, and the technologies uh, that were found in it at the time. And, and she said something like that, it's a, it's a fine building, but are there any books in the building? Which in, 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 her, in her wonderful dry humor. But I digress, and I want to say that uh, two years ago, uh, when we launched the university's strategic plan, we had made a commitment to advance how we teach. We labeled that strategic plan priority as transformative teaching, mentoring, and advising. Um, and it was part of our strategic plan, which is called Shaping UBC's Next Century. You can find it online. Just Google Shaping UBC's Next Century. You'll see the full strategic plan. And, and that plan is our collective vision for the next, uh, what we hope, a foundation for the next uh, century of, of UBC, which as many of you may know, 
is pretty young from Eastern Canadian standards. It's only 100 years old. Uh, but the reason why I bring up that strategic plan and, and the pillar of the plan, which is transformative teaching, mentoring, and advising, is to underscore the point that I just made that uh, we have been thinking uh, at the institution for a couple of decades, but increasingly uh, in recent years about how to uh, revolutionize how we teach. And I, as I said, perhaps the silver lining of this pandemic is it, it has forced us to do that uh, over, a, over a period of a few days, which is I'm sure the case with many of you as well. So the silver lining is that this pandemic uh, has accelerated something that we had planned to do anyway as part of our university strategic plan. But as you know, we are definitely not going to have to wait another 100 years to see this uh, priority realized. The pandemic has forced us to address it and confront uh, this new reality uh, over the space of days. Um, I can tell you that with the arrival of COVID-19 that we have managed to accelerate, as has been the case with each of you, our online learning environment by 10 years in a matter of uh, days. Uh, a case of move fast and break things as tech innovators like to say. Some of you may know if you've been following the UBC in the past couple of decades, uh, we're pretty proud of um, our, our commitment to changing how we teach and to, to, uh, to innovate new ways of learning and teaching. Um, and a couple of examples of that, as you may know, are that we were one of the founding members of edX. And edX is, as you know, one of the, uh, with Coursera, one of the early platforms to change how we teach and to share um, um, our best teachers are around the globe in a, in, a, in a national digital platform. So UBC has been involved in that for some time. And you may know that, that uh, Carl Wyman, a Nobel laureate, uh, who was on our faculty for some time, really um, pushed at this institution, uh, the, the, the professoriate to really rethink how we teach science. Um, and, and his uh, um, initiative is something that uh, has attracted attention around the world and as you know has been adopted by many institutions uh, such as Stanford University. So UBC is really proud of, of our commitment to innovating how we teach and how students learn. Uh, flipping the classroom, is, it, UBC was one of the early adopters of, of that concept and as you will all agree uh, that's something that we have to integrate into remote instruction as well. So at UBC uh, even before the pandemic uh, we were really trying to position ourselves for disruption and for changes in, in, in how we teach. And I want to share with you uh, what we've learned uh, during uh, those years, as well as uh, over the past uh, several months. And as I said, we're not alone. I'm certain that your own institution is experiencing very similar runaway train momentum during uh, these past several months. And I have no doubt that the foundational work of the extend uh, professional learning program from eCampus Ontario has been invaluable in empowering educators in your province to keep up with the current breakneck pace of change. And uh, many of you may feel like we do. We're in the midst of uh, uh, this term. We, we, we taught remotely uh, during summer term. And uh, in many cases, uh, the case at UBC is that we actually have many more students enrolled than we typically do. Uh, we didn't know whether we'd have a decrease in, in enrollment. Uh, we've actually seen a significant uplift during the summer term, uh, as well as uh, during uh, this uh, term that started in September. And we're projecting that in January, we'll have robust en enrollment once again. Uh, so uh, we've had to deal with remote instruction with a larger number of students, uh, with a situation where faculty members have had to transition their curriculum over a weekend to remote instruction. And that, as you know, uh, is putting tremendous stress uh, on our professors. Uh, we've had to really invest significantly uh, as an institution to provide support in a number of TAs uh, that, are, that are involved. And I'll tell you a little bit more about our investments in, in instructional design and uh, in, in our units that really help um, with uh, providing uh, high quality videos uh, and animations and simulations that are increasingly being incorporated into how we teach at, at UBC. So that's been our experience, and I'm sure it's been an experience for you as well. And uh, UBC is really committed to sharing. One of the reasons that I jumped at this opportunity to speak with you is to tell you what we're doing, uh, to have an honest conversation about what the challenges have been, and hopefully 
to form connections and collaborations across Canada so we can share best practice, uh, share our resources and our ideas and, and perhaps collaborate in, in, in this, the, the, the silver lining of this pandemic that uh, is really uh, uh, asking us to innovate uh, uh, how we uh, deliver instruction remotely. I'm daily inspired by how students, staff, faculty, administrators at this institution on both of our campuses and across the country have navigated this rapidly shifting landscape with resilience and grace. And I say so because I know uh, from talking to our faculty and talking to our students that it's not been an easy time. Um, it's estimated that the typical professor spends 67% or in some cases double the amount of time deliver the same instruction remotely as it would be the case face-to-face. Uh, -face. So there's a lot uh, that's been put on the shoulders of our faculty. And as you know, uh, in talking to your students, as is the case with us, that we know that our students are missing face-to-face -face instruction, uh, that they crave um, innovations in how we deliver remote instruction, and, and that some of them are also feeling quite isolated. And uh, we worry about the mental health of both of our students and our faculty in this rapid uh, transition to remote only instruction. Um, and that's not that entirely true at UBC. We have uh, some fraction of our programs that are face-to-face -face, where physical distancing allows. Um, and we have some hybrid uh, courses and we've been struggling with synchronous and asynchronous instruction. As you know, um, uh, although uh, enrollment is up, uh, we, our residence halls are only 43% occupied. Uh, which means that uh, many of the first year students that would typically be here are scattered around the globe. Our students are quite international. So we have a real issue uh, differently from, from, from K through 12 where our students may be halfway around the globe in a completely different uh, time zone. And we can talk a little bit of, about the challenges uh, that that uh, um, you know, brings to the institution and to professors as they, as they try to teach people that are in completely different uh, time zones. What I'd say I'm most uh, impressed uh, with in terms of our faculty, staff and students is the humanity uh, that they bring every day uh, to dealing with this unprecedented experience, dealing with the challenges that uh, they confront in, in transitioning to remote. I know everyone watching today has their own compelling stories about changing on the fly and we wanna hear about them. Uh, you've all been on the digital learning front, front line supporting faculty or teaching students. And I promise we are definitely going to have time uh, at the end of my remarks to share uh, what we're experiencing. But before we get there, I'd like to offer five important lessons that we've learned about humanizing digital spaces at UBC in the past year. And here they are. But let's be honest, for many people, the terms humanity and technology are mutually exclusive. And we have to be honest that something that is fully remote isn't very human. And so that's really part of the challenge before us, how to take an artificial situation where uh, the personal contact and uh, community that face-to-face -face instruction provides, we have to figure out how to replace that in, our, in the best possible way uh, during uh, these, these times. And as we embrace the promise and possibilities of online learning, so must we confront the very real limitations. It does no good for us to uh, ignore them or deny them. They are uh, a reality. My hope is that these takeaways will lay a foundation for some of the deeper conversations that you will be having over the next several days uh, at this conference, but over the next several months to years, as we as a sector think about what have we learned uh, from this very real situation. We should be talking about new and emerging technologies that we should uh, adopt more robustly. We must uh, think about learned leadership, uh, research and data-driven decision-making and the very important topics of empathy in teaching and how we interact with our students and engagement and being even more sensitive than usual to some of the challenges that some of our students actually face, even when instruction is face-to-face. -face. 
So let me start now with the first essential lesson, lesson in my view, which is that flexibility is not optional. One of the things that we and perhaps you experienced uh, in spring when we transitioned abruptly to remote was that we could have been more empathetic. And, 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 and one of the, the key things that uh, we could have done is to be more flexible, to, to, to think a little bit more about the accommodations that, that are needed in a virtual environment, just as they are needed when everything is face-to-face. -face. And we've had conversations with students, some of whom were quite uh, disappointed with the lack of accommodation that was part of the policies and procedures of the institution. And I think fortunately, those real and honest conversations have moved us, perhaps not enough, but to be more flexible and to be more empathetic about the situation. If you think about it, many of our students actually had to leave campus in the spring. And they were actually packing up their residence halls, getting ready to get onto a plane in very crowded. And at that time, it was unclear whether they were safe airports. And they had to go, some of them, to India or to Singapore or to London. And, in the, and, and, and during that entire disruptive period, they were, the classes were still going on. Uh, and they were going on uh, Vancouver time. And so uh, we were rightfully uh, criticized uh, as, we're, as a sector in not thinking uh, about uh, the impact of that on our students and that it was not conducive uh, to, uh, to teaching and learning. Um, and uh, uh, to the point where, as may be the case with uh, many of you, uh, that uh, there is a notation that will be going on our transcripts uh, for students during this period of time, recognizing uh, the hardship that they have experienced and, and the impact of that on their learning and, and on other grades. So as has been the case in, in, in many institutions, we have also uh, uh, accommodated and been more flexible in terms of of uh, what kinds of grades uh, would be assigned during this period of time, as well as a general notation on the transcript that really uh, underscores and recognizes the unique um, challenges that our students have experienced during this time. It's a fact by turns and exciting and, and exhausting. Online, as in real life, uh, change is only constant. To say that there's been an upheaval in the academy is a gross understatement as we've just been discussing. For many of our faculty, it feels like they're back in their first year of teaching again, as their comfortable face-to-face -face classroom routine evaporated in front of their eyes in a flash with one terrible news cycle. In this ultimate test of vulnerability and flexibility, they are learning that their students may be valuable co-creators when it comes to designing the engaging online courses that they expect and demand. One of the things that we should all do is to involve students in co-creating the virtual uh, component of what they're learning because they know best what uh, makes things fun and, uh, and, and engaging for them. So the more we involve students in the co-creation of, of, of content, the better we will be as teachers and as educational institutions. They're learning that they may never again teach that these are the teachers, the same course twice. And they're learning that online tools have a very short shelf life, but that digital fluency endures. And so one of the positive aspects of this pandemic is that, that professors that have been resistant to moving away from a piece of chalk and a chalkboard are now actually embracing uh, digital fluency because they realize that it's not clear when they can get back uh, to face-to-face -to -face instruction. In a world where there are ever more online tools and technologies available, the ability to build digital Lego by understanding and applying different tools and services to the educational goal at hand is critical to successful online teaching and learning. So one of the positive aspects of this pandemic has been that uh, more and more of our faculty members, some who have been staunch uh, critics of online learning are now realizing that it's not all that bad. And it, it, it may be a very good way to connect with this generation of students. And the old requirement to build a learning community still stands even in a virtual classroom. So even though we're talking to each other on Zoom, it's even more important that we think about building that learning community. 
in the virtual classroom. And it's a challenge, but there are learnings that are already uh, being realized across the system that we can share with each other, but techniques about building that sense of community. Our faculty are also learning that sharing power with students by understanding and embracing their preferred plat platforms as opposed to the ones we want can be equally uh, equal parts terrifying, energizing, and ultimately unifying. And that word is very important. We're in this together, whether we're administrators or professors or students, we're one university, UBC. We're one sector, post-secondary. And so the more we think that we're all part of the same team and that we have to arrive at a unifying approach using the same uh, preferred platforms and the same ways of teaching, the more successful we will be in building that virtual community uh, that is so needed uh, today. The second thing that all of us are learning is that feedback fights fatigue. And so you all know, and I'm sure um, it's, you're just the same as I am, that a full day, sometimes from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. on Zoom with uh, no bathroom breaks between meetings is, is fatiguing. And so um, the second lesson is that uh, introducing very intentionally feedback uh, during a class uh, or during a program or in the middle of a, of a course it is very, very important in combat, combating that Zoom fatigue. Whether it's Zoom or Slack or Canvas, Microsoft Teams or whatever, with so many different apps and platforms to figure out, cognitive overload is real. And it's, it's exhausting, especially for our students who may be taking three or four or even five online courses at the same time. So more attention to uh, the well being of our students and, and whether there's sufficient time to process and to question and to provide feedback on how you are doing is a critical lesson that we're learning. We're recommending at UBC that our faculty put themselves in their students' shoes and make time for a mid-course check-in to learn what is working and what is not working, honestly, from the students. It's something that should be totally distinct from teaching evaluations. The, the, the recommendation for a, a mid-course check-in is simply so we can be better teachers and be, we can build that unifying virtual community. We wanna understand how our students are managing their workload, not just in the class that say I'm teaching, but in the three, four or five classes that they're taking. Because part of the issue is not just what's happening in your class. Uh, what we have to be attuned to and sensitive to and empathetic to is the overall workload that students are experiencing, just like the overall workload for you as an administrator, as, as a teacher. It's, it's may, maybe not that particular Zoom meeting, but it's the fact that they're back to back and thinking about the overall schedule uh, for all of us is something that uh, we have to learn to integrate into how we operate as a sector. And there is room for improvement, uh, definitely. In, 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 all, in all of that. So that's one of the takeaways that we've learned. we've learned. It's definitely not intended as a performance evaluation, as I said, that doesn't work. The last thing we need to do is to, to put on another evaluation uh, during these challenging times, but rather something to help with morale. If you have a, a class full of happy virtual students, then it will impact you as a professor. It'll impact your department and your institution. Student satisfaction is certainly something that is and should be a priority for all of us as administrators. So it's a way to shorten the distance between faculty and students. So take that uh, mid-course check-in uh, as a, as a de department head or as a provost or as a president or as a system, we should honestly discuss our shortcomings in terms of the virtual classroom and learn from that and do better the next time, say in January of 2021. And we found that when professors take the time to consider all of the feedback and then respond authentically to the class about what will change as a result, to say, this is what I heard, and this is how I'm gonna actually change um, the course syllabus. And this is how I'm gonna change how we teach in a given day. This is how we're gonna integrate more of a flipped classroom kind of a component where you will be receiving a video lecture in advance but we will really dedicate more time during the allocated classroom 
to have a conversation or to integrate more of a team-based, project-based uh, 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 framework to that uh, classroom time. And also perhaps to integrate more outside of the classroom or maybe during that classroom uh, projects that can be done in the residence hall or in the room where the student is in a virtual situation. The more we bring those kinds of, of interactive uh, and team-based approaches um, to the classroom, we know that we can enhance uh, the, the sense of community in that virtual classroom and also the satisfaction of the student in their educational experience. So responding authentically to the feedback will change our success and will build uh, trust uh, between the students uh, and the institution that we're actually listening and altering what we do and co-creating our approach. Uh, those are things that we're finding here at UBC. The next lesson is we've had to reimagine faculty support. As I said, we know from talking to our faculty that up to 67% or, or, or up to a doubling of the time uh, that's required to prepare for a class is a reality for our faculty. It's not something that we could have predicted and it happened abruptly. And because the transition in COVID-19 happened abruptly, we were not prepared to provide adequate additional support so that we could ensure uh, the wellness of our faculty. And we've learned from that. Note that I say reimagine, because the truth is all of us, and I've talked a little bit about what is part of our strategic plan. We've all been thinking about how to reimagine the classroom experience already. We've already been investing in things like the Centers for Teaching, Learning and Technology, our CTLT, and I'm sure you have similar units at your institution. And we've already been investing and participating in consortia like edX. So we've already been doing this as a sector uh, in Ontario, in BC, in Quebec, all, all around the world. But this pandemic has forced us, as I said at the very start of my talk, to start to really intensively reimagine and, and, and embrace with urgency uh, how we teach. Um, and, and, and these units, the Centers for Teaching and Learning and Technology, uh, have during this period, very period of time been the heroes. They've had to respond very quickly. And, and the, the volume of work that they're involved in has, has increased not 67% or 100%, in many cases, five to tenfold over a normal time. So imagining how we support them is, is something that's incredibly important, these, these support units, because they support the faculty to make that transition to not only digital learning, but also a sense of community within a virtual context. And we, probably like you, are stretched to capacity. And we've had to invest quickly uh, and, and significantly uh, to help them help our faculty. And, and they're continually working to take the learnings from the feedback from students to integrate those ideas in the co-creation to continuously evolve what we do, even in the mid middle of a course. To give you an idea, UBC has invested $36 million in additional support that was not planned so that we could, and we took that from reserves during a period of time where we, we had a, a significant uh, negative financial impact. But that was necessary and is necessary moving into January to support faculties in a rapid shift to even better online teaching and learning. About a third from our teaching and learning enhancement fund that is, has been tapped to the max, and the rest from what we call the Academic Excellence Fund, and also from reserves within each of our faculties. I think it's important to note that our faculties have stepped up, not only the central administration, but the deans and the faculties at UBC have really stepped up to help share the burden, financial and otherwise, of these challenges. And the reason why it's necessary is that our students expect, and we have promised them, uh, a rich, rewarding teaching experience. And to, to, to transition a virtual experience to be one which is first rate really requires investment as well as time. We've impl implemented new one-on-one -on -one sessions for faculty members to meet with educational consultants to help design online courses or to review and improve existing courses. We've ramped up our ability to provide support and in instructional design. And we have doubled the capacity of our learning technology rovers program 
And I'm sure you have similar programs at your institutions. So we've hired a number of high tech savvy individuals called Rovers to provide rapid response solutions to ed tech issues among faculty. And, and so, as you know, your faculty, I mean, most of them are working at home. So these could be uh, rovers that are connecting virtually, or in some cases, when it's actually safe, there can be actually uh, a meeting uh, in, in a facility where you can actually, the rovers can actually uh, teach faculty members about certain technologies that they might not be familiar with. Tech rovers, as we call them, are typically undergraduate, sometimes graduate students, hired on co-op terms uh, for across, from across all of our faculties because these tech rovers need not only be uh, up to date with technology and platforms, but they also ideally understand the subject matter that uh, they're working on with, with, with the faculty member. And they help faculty members do for themselves when it comes to technology. So it's really an interaction which is mutually beneficial. Um, and it's, that's why it's very important for the tech rovers to understand technology, but also subject matter. They work as a team to really enrich the content uh, that's delivered virtually. They won't fix your printer, even though some professors have asked them to fix their printer. Uh, they won't get involved in copyright clearance for text, but they will show you how to do something and how to make it come to life for the student because they are themselves students, uh, upper year students or graduate students. So then the next time you actually prepare a course or try to design something that's a simulation that you can do it with confidence. And we find that that investment, the doubling of the number of tech rovers is probably the, the most brilliant investment that we have made. They are, these tech rovers, highly responsive, incredibly professional. And now, now there are twice as many of them as previously. And that is uh, something that we will have to continuously evaluate and we may have to increase our investment in tech rovers even more. And the positive thing I should say, as you know, is that with many student jobs actually disappearing and eva evaporating, for example, um, uh, residents, uh, residents as hall assistants and things like that, many of those jobs evaporating, they needed employment as well. So it's a win-win for the student as well as for the professor and for the institution as a whole. The fourth lesson out of five is that we've learned is that one size does not fit all. So what my work in science or in arts may not work in land and food systems or in medicine. So we have to have a differentiated model of support for our faculty. Different students at different stages respond to different kinds of programs. So, so, so we, that's why it's really important for these rovers to be from multiple faculties. And it's why it's important for the tech rover, if at all possible, to be from the faculty where the professor is actually situated. Inclusion is integral to our vision at UBC. We believe no student should be disadvantaged and we have long accommodated diverse student needs in traditional classroom settings. And that's just as important in a virtual classroom than in, a, in, in, a, in an actual terrestrial classroom. Today, our students are scattered now around the globe, facing a whole new set of virtual learning challenges that require an even broader range of concessions, as I mentioned early on. You know that 2 p.m. lecture that you might have? That's 2 a.m. in China. And that's if they actually have internet access and Wi-Fi, or if their content uh, is, is something that is acceptable in a particular jurisdiction. Your requirement that students leave their cameras on to demonstrate participation, we know that for some students, that's uh, really intimidating. And for that reason, I just actually personally taught in a class about language and society. And I was surprised that uh, when I looked at the Zoom classroom, that about 60% of the cameras were off. It's not something that I wanted. I would much prefer to see their faces, but I understood that for that cohort of students and for another uh, class that I taught, which was on equity, diversity and inclusion, that there were real reasons why the cameras had to be off. Students uh, shouldn't feel intimidated in a virtual classroom. And so you have to be sensitive to that. And, and in some cases you have to explain to faculty members who might not understand why all the cameras are off that that's something that's a concession and accommodation that we should make so that our students feel embraced and do not feel intimidated in that interaction. 
it's challenging for students who may be in caregiving roles or who have a spotty internet or who simply don't have access to a camera. We have to be, as I said, flexible and empathetic to their situation in this unusual environment. As you're planning your virtual courses, think about students living in a variety of different con contexts and circumstances and make your des decision about design so that you support and include as many students as possible. I like this example of one of our professors, uh, an English professor, her name is Tiffany Potter, who has found a way to foster community among online students without overwhelming them. First, she creates small learning teams of three or four students who are assigned to check in with each other over the term. Integrated, uh, a, a, a virtual group, a community within the classroom, just so that they can check in with each other and make sure that they've transitioned well from the actual face-to-face -face classroom to the virtual classroom, to introduce small community into what might be a class that has 30 or 300 or 500 students. So really think uh, about the structure of your classrooms and how you create micro communities in a larger classroom to build a sense of community, to make it smaller. Then recognizing that it would be impractical, not mention overstimulating, to have 180 faces on a single Zoom screen, she assigns six students at a time to appear on screen as designated respondents for synchronous class sessions. So you know in advance if your face is gonna be on the screen. And otherwise you could be listening in in your pajamas. Uh, and so people know, there's no surprises. She doesn't have to lecture into a void and her students, because she can see those six faces and her students are able to schedule their class participation and get to know their peers in a more intimate way. It's a win-win for the professor as well as for the student. The fifth and last lesson that I want to leave you with is perhaps most important of all from our perspective. And for the teachers that are listening, this is for you. Having actually personally taught a couple of classes during COVID, I understand this feeling. You don't really know whether you're doing a good job when you're talking to a computer screen, an iPad or a desktop. It's really hard to gauge how you're doing because you don't really have the total feedback real time that you do in a classroom. It's you, you, you see, see uh, you don't see things in, in three dimensions. Uh, often you see just the face. If you do see a face, um, you really can't see the body language and, and the things that you can pick up on quickly if you're in front of a class. And sometimes you're hard on yourself because you, uh, overinterpret silence or the lack of questions in chat to the fact that perhaps you're failing in teaching, in engaging the students. And it's actually, in many cases, absolutely the wrong conclusion. So the last lesson that I want to leave with the teachers that are listening is to be easy on yourself. Forgive yourself if you make a mistake. This is hard. Uh, you, are, you may be in a situation where you don't have adequate support. You don't have a tech rover to come help you out with a class or with a technological issue. And that's okay because you, then you haven't been set up appropriately to succeed and it's not your fault. So the last lesson is, is uh, be, be forgiving uh, of, of yourself. I'd like to share some thoughts from Dr. Simon Bates, uh, who's an extraordinary individual at UBC who is really the force behind UBC's Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology. And it's been that for quite some time, and it's for that reason that we're very proud of that center. While reflecting on, on what words of encouragement I might offer you today, I asked him, this is what he said, and I'll quote him. None of us chose this environment, yet here we all are. There's no perfect solution. Make changes and corrections as you go. Give yourself permission for it not to be perfect. I'll tell you, as president of UBC with some remarkable faculty and students, uh, with a community of almost uh, 80, 85,000 people, with all those more remarkable people, not one of them is perfect. And so we should all be easy and empathetic 
uh, and forgive ourselves for any mistakes that we make. To that end, Simon points to the first principle of UBC's teaching online guidelines, all of which, by the way, you can see yourself going online to our online site, keepteaching.ubc.ca. It's our way of sharing what we've learned about remote instruction with the rest of the world. Please look at it. The first guiding principle states of that, uh, that, that site, approach adoption, course adoption decisions with a commitment to compassion and care for everyone involved, the students, but also you as an instructor. For everyone involved includes you as a faculty member. When you start from a place of care and compassion, students will forgive you when things don't work quite right. And you'll forgive yourself too. You'll reduce stress all around. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day and I asked that person, you know, what is it that you're looking for in a faculty member? Are you looking for the sage that understands uh, every question and has an answer to every question? who is always flawless in, in conveying uh, a complex uh, concept. And the student surprised me and said, no, that's not what endears me the most to my favorite professor or faculty member. What this person said was actually the professor's superpower is that professor's uh, vulnerability. Believe it or not, students are actually looking for <clears throat> something beyond perf perfection recognizing that people aren't perfect. <clears throat> and they're actually, the, probably the, the best way to show compassion is to show your vulnerability. It makes you more approachable, more real, and makes them feel less, uh, less guilty if they don't do something perfectly. And so one of the most compassionate things you can do as a faculty member is to show your vulnerability, to admit your mistakes, and to admit your imperfections. It's good for your wellness as well as for the wellness of your students as well. It reduces stress all around. And that's a good thing anytime, even when there isn't a pandemic uh, nipping at your heels. So those are my brief learnings that I wanted to share with you from our collective recent experiences at the University of British Columbia. But be assured there are many more. I urge you, as I said, to visit our site, which is now projected on the screen, keepteaching.ubc. CA. And that title, Keep Teaching, is exactly what I've been trying to say. This is a challenge for all of us. We weren't given the heads up, a warning that this curveball was coming at us. It's remarkable what has been accomplished thus far. And it's like showing up every day at work. You get better every day. You learn. You admit uh, when you make mistakes. And you just keep your focus on being empathetic and forgiving them and to creating more, a richer experience on a daily incremental basis. You just keep showing up day after day, keep teaching. That uh, this uh, uh, site uh, is for teachers, but we also have in addition for students. And you can look at this as well, whether you're a student or you're a teacher, it's also instructive. We have mirrored sites. We have one for teachers called keepteaching.ubc.ca. And we have one that has tremendous student uh, uh, feedback and input, which is called keeplearning.ubc.ca. And if you look at those two, you'll see the guiding principles, but you'll also see what we learn uh, over, the, over the upcoming months and, 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 and year or more, uh, how we actually learn um, and from ourselves, uh, from self-assessments, as well as uh, from uh, feedback from our students about how best to teach and from their perspective as students, how best to learn in a fully remote environment. If ever, there was an example of not letting perfection get in the way of good enough. Those two sites are added. They are honest uh, representations of what we learn as we move through this pandemic together. We knew the pandemic's arrival in British Columbia was just a matter of when, not if. And as you know, it was the Pacific Northwest was one of the very, very first provinces to be affected by COVID-19. And so we moved fast to get those sites up. We embraced an iterative approach and had the first helpful content up in early March, just weeks after we had to close because of the pandemic. 
It certainly didn't look as good back then as it does now, because as I said, it's an iterative site that, that we, we share what we learn with ourselves and with the rest of the world. But it got to train on the tracks and made sure our faculty and students had a go-to place for online learning guidance and support right from the start. And every day it gets better. I believe that as educators, we have an important role in stewarding the conversation around humanizing digital spaces because we are in fact the humans in the system. We are what humanizes the artificial nature of a technology delivered learning platform. If you find these websites valuable, we know they're being accessed by people from all over Canada and in fact, all over the world. We would be honored if you would look at it and give us feedback. We wanna share, but we also wanna learn from each and every one of you. I hope that you'll feel free to share them across your networks and with anyone who might actually benefit, even your students, from what we have learned. I've spoken a little bit longer than I was supposed to. I'm, I apologize, Daniel. Thank you for staying with me uh, this little bit longer than I, I had anticipated. I hope you aren't experiencing too much Zoom fatigue listening to me. I'm really keen to hear about your own experiences in this realm. So now let's open up to Q&A. Thank you, everybody. Dr. Ono, thank you very much. This was really enlightening. Uh, we really appreciate it. And um, I know that uh, someone from my communications department right now is tweeting out all that information about, uh, about the website and, and where to go. We have some, some really good questions and we have a few minutes. Um, and I'm going to start with one um, that uh, Nick Baker uh, had, had asked. And it is, um, where are the tech rovers based? How are they supervised, trained, trained, and supported? As it sounds like they have an integral first level of pedagogical support. It's a great question. So as I said, the tech rovers come from every faculty and they're, uh, they're upper class students. So they have quite a bit of experience. Um, it's a very selective process. It's a, it's a, it's a group that it's, it's uh, prestigious to be part of. Um, they're located now with um, most of the instruction at UBC being remote. They can be located anywhere. They can be in, in their homes or in, in, in the ca cases where they're in residence halls, they can be in the residence halls. How are they instructed? Well, we talked a little bit about um, our significant increase investment in a center for teaching and learning and technology. So uh, the individuals there uh, are experts and they've been involved in tremendous amount of uh, instructional design and strategy in terms of our involvement in edX. So, the expertise is already embedded within UBC. So we're fortunate that we had that head start and, and, and we had that as a focal point for building out um, this uh, cohort of tech rovers. So they can be anywhere, but they can also be face-to-face -face because uh, some of our faculty are, te are teaching face-to-face -face and some of them are in their offices. In those cases, we adhere to all the public health guidelines for that interaction. We have dedicated facilities at UBC uh, where uh, they're almost like television studios. Uh, and, and we have lots of technology that's available and we've had to invest in additional technology as well. So hopefully that answers that question. James Skidmore, thank you. James Skidmore has a question. He says, it seems that some institutions, um, actually, I'll just skip up. He said, uh, some institutions expect that once the pandemic is over, we can go back to the way things were before, um, which is an interesting juxtaposition when you think about technology and advancement. But the pivot to remote instruction in higher ed has encouraged creativity and innovation at the course level, and it will become a shame to lose that. What plans does UBC have to capture and sustain these innovations? Well, as, uh, well thanks for that question. Um, as, as I've mentioned, we've already invested in this quite a bit already in building out the Center for Teaching Learning Technology. Um, the investment in that has grown. And I don't think it's going to retract back to pre-COVID levels. You know, one of the things that we've learned from uh, surveying our faculty and our students is that a remarkably high proportion of our staff and faculty actually have decided that they actually like um, remote instruction. Um, there are a number of reasons to that. One is that they've actually learned that it's very effective um, and they have to continuously improve on how they deliver virtual instruction. But from a very real and personal perspective, um, in, in some cases, uh, our faculty have to travel quite a bit, quite far to get from their homes to, to their offices or to the classrooms. This actually cuts out that commute time. And in an, in an expensive metropolitan area like Toronto or Vancouver, um, 
it's actually uh, the ability to actually teach remotely um, and the lack of requirement to be cam on campus all the time can actually have a real advantage to a faculty member who could live in, in a more affordable neighborhood a little bit further away if you cut away to commute. Uh, that makes that uh, more, of, more of a possibility. So um, just to give you the numbers, I think uh, these are early days, somewhere around 83% uh, to 90% 90, 90 of faculty and staff have said uh, they would like post pandemic uh, for us to retain uh, some aspect of virtual instruction or virtual work. Uh, and we are as an institution seriously considering that for a number of reasons, the wellness of our faculty and staff uh, is, is one of our top priorities. And if they tell us, and the students tell us that uh, there has been enough progress in, 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 in content delivery and they'd be happy with some component of that, then it could be a win-win for faculty, staff, and students. So we're not, gonna, we're not gonna jettison what we've learned during this period. We're gonna actually use what we've learned to rethink what a university will be like uh, moving forward. Thank you. Has your institution, just, this is from Julie Harwood, has your institution given any thought yet about how student success measurements might change given the new modes of teaching and learning and how that might be incorporated into the course delivery and design in the future? Well, I, I kind of tried to touch upon that uh, in, in, mm -hmm. in one of my remarks that uh, I'm encouraging, right. we're, we're encouraging people to integrate uh, real time, even mid course or even on a weekly basis, um, uh, you know, and, and to encourage self assessment. Um, and, and because self-assessment, uh, in, in some cases, people feel that's a chore, but what we're finding and, and is also in the literature is that some aspect of self-assessment or an e-portfolio comp comp component that's parallel to the curriculum is something that engages the student and, and where they can actually see um, the meaning of the concepts or the relevance of the concepts that uh, they're, they're, they're mastering. Uh, while the course actually progresses. And they can also look back and reflect upon, oh, what I learned in calculus was actually very, very important for what I'm, what I'm, what I'm learning in mechanical engineering. So, so there's an advantage to maybe beefing up self-assessment um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and also um, to, to integrate into the whole process um, honest feedback to the instructor uh, so that even during a course, mid-course, you can actually pivot or, or modify uh, your approach uh, to a given lecture to the benefit of the student. Thank you. I will ask um, a question from Lena Patterson. She's with eCampus Ontario and I'm allowing, I'm going to read this question because she's a very, very proud Vancouverite and likes, likes to remind us that uh, she's from, from your neck of the woods. So you made some excellent points about the importance of using teaching evaluations and tenure and promotion processes to encourage good practice. How do we rethink these systems of reward and promotion to encourage high quality teaching, both virtual and also face-to-face? -face? Yeah, you know, I think teaching evaluations, you gotta be careful uh, because uh, with them uh, come uh, concerns about their use and a bias that uh, is actually uh, embedded in, in the teaching evaluation system. So, um, you know, I think it's really important to distinguish a teaching evaluation, which is evaluative, to uh, this kind of in-course assessment, which is meant to, to uh, provide opportunities for, uh, that have nothing to do with evaluation, that are truly formative to allow the instructor and the student as as, as partners in the learning experience to, to work together. And uh, so that's the way I think about it. I, I don't, I'm not personally an advocate of integrating this into the teaching evaluation framework because I personally um, think that there needs to be much more conversation about bias um, that is introduced into that system. So I'd rather advocate for integrated in, integrating it into the course design into the syllabus and, and, and encouraging faculty in a, in a positive way to consider integrating things such as the e-curriculum as a parallel to, to what's happening within the classroom, if that, if that, if that helps. Thank you. And that was the, the last question. I just want to uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to connect with all of us here at uh, TEST 2020. It's, it's been an absolute honor. It's been a delight to have you. Uh, I'm honored to have had the, uh, the privilege of, of facilitating and, 
and introducing you. Take care of yourself. You do a lot of great things to keep yourself centered during these difficult times. Keep up with that. And I just say uh, that um, it's been an honor to be with each of you today. I've, I've actually perused the people who are here today and I have tremendous respect for you. And so I was very sincere at the outset where I said, let's, let's work together as a sector. It's very easy to connect with me. My uh, uh, email address is uh, s for Santa, j for Jeremy, o, sjo at ubc.ca. But you can also connect with me by direct messaging uh, me on social media. And my uh, address is at ubcprez. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we'll all do that. Take care. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Thank you.